Hello and welcome back to another set of Generation Films. My name is American Ben and today we are going to explain why the humans in Avatar The Way of Water are right. Yes, I return to you once again this day. Generally speaking, I continue in my old age to forfend the lustful maw of social media and enjoy retirement on a beach just outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Ah yes, I was enjoying my time away from this godforsaken hellhole, but they just keep pulling me back in. So for the good of the people this day and for the good of humanity in all, I return to defend my brethren. And it's not gonna be much of a challenge to make my argument because while Avatar Waterway is a putative philosophical treatise on the inevitable pitfalls ultimately begotten by running and hiding from one's enemies, I feel that it's more pressing philosophical premise intentionally imbued in the narrative or not focuses on the justness of the human invasion of Pandora. And listen, while the film might not intend to be deeply intellectual fare, the questions it poses within the contexts of this latter subtext are actually quite mentally stimulating. And there are no easy answers here because the film presents us with some real moral conundrums in this regard. Now, you should know, I really have no dire horse in this race, so I'm not going in with any sort of bias. I just, I see philosophical questions, and like a hammerhead titanotheer, I pounce. Does it bother me that Neytiri has a deeply vitriolic hatred of humans? To Neytiri, he would always be alien. One of them. Mom, a hatred that leads her to basically go full Abraham on her adopted human son? No, not at all. And just because I feel the joie de vivre of an untethered mountain banshee soaring through the Hallelujah Mountains when I see Miles' young thug Quaritch ready to get marine funky in the name of humanity doesn't mean I'm some insufferable fanboy of his. So you needn't take anything I say with a grain of unobtainium. Nay, my reasons for defending humanity today are born of dispassion, however great my jingoistic whims may try me. And such reasons are threefold. The first reason why I'm loath to condemn the humans in the film is that their invasion is not born upon frivolous motives. Earth is dying after all, and the humans thus are in a position where they must quickly find a habitable planet to resettle on. Now, I readily concede that it may be due to human fault that Earth's resources have been depleted and the Earth itself is declining towards uninhabitability. However, the question of human culpability in Earth's deterioration is more one that casts blame on past peoples for their neglect of Earth than it does on those venturous pioneers in the present who are trying to find a new home for humanity to sustain the species. Yeah, the humans in the film possibly mismanaged their home planet, but does that mean they should just accept extinction, or should they do whatever they can in order to survive? I'd posit that anyone who suggests the former mode of procession to be most optimal, at least for humans, is not drawing their conclusions by considering the human perspective. If the consequence for not settling Pandora was lesser, I'd agree that the humans would be wrong to invade. But the consequence for remaining on Earth is, again, the death of humanity. And death, in my view, is always the most irrational end to advance upon as it involves the elimination of the self. However, there is the question of alternative options to Pandora. As far as I know, there aren't many viable alternatives for human settlement beyond the Navi home planet. And additionally, while maybe not a perfect landing spot for the necessarily oxygenating human race, Pandora does seem like a pretty damn good option, given its availability of natural resources which humans can exploit to their benefit. At the center of this resource pool lies the precious substances Unobtainium and Amrita. Amrita we'll talk about in a few minutes, but Unobtainium is a mineral the RDA mines on Pandora for a variety of human life-sustaining purposes related to energy conduction. Avatar's lore suggests that the RDA has been suppressing the development of alternatives to unobtainium on Earth, which, if true, would hinder the company's argument that mining the mineral on Pandora is a necessary evil humans must undertake. 
That may be true, but it certainly sounds like a simplification, and we can't make assumptions here without being fully informed about the feasibility of pursuing a viable alternative to unobtainium off Pandora. What we do know is that unobtainium can afford Earth's 20 billion humans a chance of surviving their current resource crisis. If Earth's resources begin to run dry tomorrow, and one of the planet's wealthiest entrepreneurs, say Jeff Bezos, announces that he has the technology to mine life-sustaining resources on a foreign planet that another sentient but militarily inferior species inhabits, wouldn't you want him to try and do it? The second reason I've positioned myself as a human apologist today, as specifically concerned to the humans in Avatar, is, as I alluded to earlier, the Tolkun, the whale-like creatures that live in the waters of Pandora, produce a substance called Amrita, from a gland in their brains that can be converted by humans into a serum that reverses the human aging process. Let me repeat. Reverses the human aging process. The reason I'm about to expound upon is related to the first, as it's an argument about resources. So feel free to label it 1B instead of 2 if you're that sort of captious martinet douche. Colonel Quaritch may be committed to hostility, but the colonization efforts of the humans on Pandora at large seem to be focused on a range of legitimate life-sustaining endeavors. Granted, such endeavors do come at the expense of the moon's natural habitat. In Avatar Waterworld, Tolkun are being hunted by the humans, and it's not easy to watch. After all, these scrumptious-looking beasts are hardly beasts at all. The Tolkun is a highly intelligent species, the members of which certainly know and feel the horrors that are being exacted upon them. There's no way around this. The Tolkun are being massacred for the sake of humanity. However, and I know how awkward it is for me to inject a however after that last sentence, the product of this massacre is an anti-aging serum. And while the perpetuation of humanity may not rest on obtaining the substance that produces this serum, as is perhaps true of unobtainium, the attainment of eternal life does sound like it would solve the human's whole we're trending towards extinction problem. Moreover, the discovery of an element that can grant eternal life will likely have such a profound impact on humanity's future and the future of the universe more broadly that I think we can at least say that the moral implications of sucking out Tolkun brain to produce the anti-aging serum are not entirely clear. How did I end up making another video that's going to get me canceled? I've really tried for that not to happen. I can imagine that if it was discovered that a mutation in my DNA made my blood capable of curing all forms of human disease, there would probably be more than a few people a bit peeved at me if I refused to allow my blood to be harvested for the betterment of the human race overall. That reminds me of that really sweet moment when a viewer on this channel once offered to be my blood bag. Or better yet, what if my brain produced the cancer-curing substance and it could potentially be replicated, but in order to extract it, I'd need to be killed or at least lobotomized? Sounds kind of fun. I really hope for my personal sake that this doesn't happen. But for the rest of you, I rather morbidly sort of hope it does. Would I run from y'all like a man framed for murder does from Tommy Lee Jones? Absolutely. But would I get the impulse to try to strap me down and convert me into a blood bag? Yeah. Would it be awesome if humanity decided they'd let me live for the sake of goodness? Yes, that would be oh so beautiful and collectively redeeming for our entire species. But it would also be incredibly dumb. Not that a panacea for disease wouldn't usher in novel problems, but we should probably err on the side of obtaining said panacea. Listen, Jimmy Boy Cameron could have chosen to make the product of the Tolkien's brains something less lucrative for humanity. For instance, he could have made the substance extracted only capable of rousing humans who ingest it into a state of extreme euphoria. Then the RDA's Tolkien hunters would have come off way more morally wretched. But our boy Jimmy didn't do that, did he? No, instead he chose to endow the Tolkien with Wait for it, godlike healing powers. And by the way, I'm not so much buying that 
Our boy Jimmy wants his audience to interpret the events on Pandora as composing an easily discernible moral conflict. The right thing to do here is not clear either way, but neither is the wrong thing. That said, I do have some questions I'd like to ask the researchers on the RDA's Tolkien Assault Squads before I conclude that ripping the beast's innards to shreds by way of explosive torpedo is an acceptable way to proceed. First, and obviously, I'd like to know if it's possible to extract the Tolkoon's special substance without killing the Tolkoon. If there is indeed a feasible, even if more difficult and expensive, method of extracting the substance that the RDA is neglecting to employ, I'll certainly condemn the organization. I also wonder what steps the RDA's Tolkoon teams have taken to negotiate with the Tolkoon. Has the RDA employed Tolkien translators in an attempt to work out a fair exchange for the Whale Serum? If no such efforts have been made, again, I'll condemn the RDA. Of course, if it's not possible to extract the anti-aging substance without killing the Tolkien, then negotiating is probably out of the question anyway. Though, without speaking with the Tolkien, I'm not sure the RDA can know for sure what's possible. The third and final reason I'm acutely wrapped up in remonstration for the sake of the much maligned humans in Avatar is that, well, the Na'vi seem rather belligerent. I'm not gonna be so disingenuous as to pretend that we can pinpoint a progenitor of the violence on Pandora, and certainly the humans trespassed into the Na'vi's territory first. But the conflict on Pandora between humans and Na'vi does not seem to at all be defined by unilateral or incitative violence on the part of humanity. I do concede that the humans are an invasionary force in this case, but it isn't totally clear to me that humanity could carve out a settlement on Pandora peacefully even if the RDA approached the Navi's leaders more diplomatically. In many cases, the Navi quite clearly lash out in violence towards humans first, and some of the movie's dialogue indicates that the Na'vi is using force against the RDA not in response to force exacted on them by the RDA, but in response to the humans' attempts to mine and settle the planet. Nothing less than to make Pandora the new home for humanity. But before we can do that, we need to pacify the hostiles. Now, of course, I'm not trying to imply that the Na'vi are depraved agents of chaos, either. I think there's plenty of legitimacy to the argument that the Na'vi have a right to protect their home, whether the humans intend them direct violence or not. We may simply be witnessing one of the universe's rather common cases of the welfare of opposing factions is either somewhat or totally mutually exclusive. Hence, much of the violence that takes place in nature throughout history. We can sympathize with the plight of both species, humans and Navi. We can recognize the disruption and damage being done to the Navi's habitat, while also acknowledging that the humans invading and settling Pandora are trying to survive. In this way, I might offer you a new paradigm by which to interpret the events on Pandora. Are the humans violent colonizers who are overrunning a peaceful Navi species and destroying Pandora's beautiful natural habitat, but for the sake of sating their avarice? Or are the humans refugees? Albeit technologically superior refugees who are attempting to facilitate their perpetuation on Pandora in the face of a dangerous and xenophobic Navi enemy. Perhaps in truth, James Cameron intends for us to grapple with these difficult questions and have trouble determining right and wrong. The film actually underscores the great tension of existence, that energy is constantly being converted for the sake of survival. We are all resources, and everything and everyone needs other resources to survive. Everyone and everything needs other resources to be destroyed to attain the energy necessary to survive. To me, this is the most thoughtful and important idea conveyed by Avatar Waterboy. There is infinite energy in the universe, but finite resources, finite viable habitats, and species throughout existence fending for survival by fighting to attain the requisite share of resources to avoid dying out. And success in pursuit of survival is achieved by construction through destruction. 
Matter of one form is converted to matter of another form. In other words, the battle we witness in Avatar is quite reflective of the universe's fundamental principles. It is a battle for energy. Now, coming back down from the ether, you'll notice I haven't spent my time in this video specifically defending Colonel Quaritch's actions in the film. He may or may not be guilty of committing reprehensible and unjustified transgressions, such as we see in his vengeful targeting of Jake Sully and his family, in how he puts children in harm's way to advance his mission, and in his overall brutality. However, I'm focused on exploring the implications born of the larger human invasion of Pandora. It's possible, and certainly even probable, that there are individuals among the human forces who are iniquitous and guilty of great evils. That said, I can't help but wonder if Cameron has intentionally imbued Quaritch's character with some level of pathos. After all, he's not completely void of a conscience, and he shows mercy numerous times in the film, especially at the behest of his son. As far as I can recall, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, we do not see Quaritch commit murder wantonly or without hesitation. During his encroachment into Mekayina territory, he even seems to be doing what he can to mitigate violence. But still, it's his pursuit of Jake Sully that instigates the conflict between them and ultimately results in death and destruction. So I can't completely absolve him of fault here. But his actions on the whole are consistent within the film's larger context, which is defined by morally ambiguous conflicts and vexing philosophical questions of right and wrong. Kudos to James Cameron, truly. He's a visionary and a genius, but as well, I think he gets written off a little too quickly as thematically unsophisticated in his writing. There's no way he doesn't recognize the complicated moral questions inherent to his film. Or better yet, I find it highly unlikely that such elements aren't intentionally devised by him. Anyhow, I actually love the Avatar films. They're fun, breakthrough, and just damn beautiful in all ways. But it's still fun to have some polemical fun with them. Anyways, that's the video. That's my argument. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do give it a big thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the video, what you think of everything I said. Want to hear if you agree or disagree, or just say hi if you haven't done so in a while. I haven't been around in a while, so it'd be understandable. Um, subscribe to this channel, obviously, and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.